Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Security in the 21st Century. I'm your host, Dr. Suzanne Loftus, and I have with me on the show today, Sham Tekwami, who is a professor at the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, which is actually our sister center. And uh, Sham specializes in terrorism, South Asia, and media and security. So Sham, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Morning, Susan, and thank you very much for having me on the show. It's really a pleasure to be back here. Uh, it's been a long while, uh, what, 18 months since uh, we had anything to do with PTs, with, uh, with, uh, with the Marshall Center and APCSS, at least on my part. But thanks for having me on the show. Real pleasure to be back. Thanks a lot. And yeah, if we can't do in-person activities, this is the second best. Absolutely. For now, yes. Yeah, for now. So uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about some of the articles that you've written recently. So you've written a lot about India and about Pakistan. And I wanted to tie in what you've written on some of the main themes of this video podcast series, which have a lot to do with great power competition. And uh, you know the influence of China in the region, which you also touched upon. So since Narendra Modi became prime minister in uh, the summer of 2014, the Bharatiya Janata Party, along with its mother organization, uh, started this uh, Hindutva project that you mentioned, and it's, it's allowing Modi to kind of rescript the idea of India around the myths of a supreme Hindu race predating the arrival of Islamic and Western civilizations on its shores. So could you tell us a little bit more about this Hindutva project? What is this about and what is the ultimate goal? And if I summarize that incorrectly, please uh, let us know a little bit more what the correct background is. Oh, yes, Suzanne, thanks. Um, well, for starters, uh, the Hindutva project uh, predates Modi. Um, um, there's this organization called the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS, which is the mother organization. And uh, it uh, goes back uh, almost 100 years. Uh, it was, uh, the organization was conceived around the time of Hitler and Mussolini. And they drew a lot of inspiration from both those gentlemen, if they can be called that. And uh, you have to remember, uh, the, well, the entire notion of the RSS was uh, in, in India was uh, always hin a Hindu country, and bottom line is uh, India is for the Hindus. So the, the other name for it they gave was Hindustan, which basically means the land of the Hindus. So obviously that meant it had no room or little, little space for uh, religions other than Hinduism. And that obviously meant Islam because that was the strongest influence in Indian history till, of course, the Brits came um, many years later. So when the RSS was formed, uh, it set about uh, trying to propagate the idea of a Hindu nation, an exclusively Hindu nation. And bear in mind, the assassin of Mahatma Gandhi on the 30th of January 1948 was not a Muslim. It was a Hindu fanatic from this organization, the RSS. And what was his peeve? The fact that Gandhi was seen as appeasing the Muslims. And uh, that did not go down very well with the organization who saw, who saw Gandhi as being more, more pro-Muslim than Hindu. So that's the genesis in a nutshell. And ever since then, uh, they've always fancied themselves or labeled themselves as a social cultural organization, basically reviving this, you know, the, the lost traditions of Hindu society. Now bear in mind again, that when they talk about Hindu society, they're, they're, they're basically talking about you know, the mythological interpretation of India. There was no India before the Brits came. It was just a disparate uh, you know, geographical entity with many kingdoms. Um, but that's going far back in history. The point being, uh, RSS set itself up with the idea of making India a Hindu nation. And, and they had uh, several political outfits, uh, basically contesting elections through parliament and all that stuff. Uh, didn't make much of a dent uh, until, until the early 90s, uh, when uh, their political project with the BJP, the, the Bharatiya Janata Party, it took off. And uh, the, 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 I would say the defining moment was in December 1992, 
when mobs, the Hindu mobs, under the guidance and direction of the BJP and its assorted uh, groupings, they tore down a 16th century mosque in uh, Ayodhya in India, in, in Northern India. Since then, uh, they, were, they have been able to galvanize uh, populations around the concept of Hindu, uh, Hindu nation. And they scored their biggest win in 2014 when Modi came to power. Now, interestingly, uh, he did come to power despite reservations among large sections of populations about his antecedents. Remember again, in 2002, when he was a chief minister of a large province in Western India, Gujarat, uh, there was carnage. Over a thousand Muslims were killed under his watch in his state. Uh, some refer to it as a genocide too. And as a result of which, even the United States of America and most European capitals refused to give Modi a visa to come to their country. And that ban on his visa was lifted only after he won the elections in 2014. Now he came on the promise of rebuilding India's economy and making India great again. Now, whatever that means. Uh, so he was going to make India great again, and uh, of course, uh, by which time uh, people were a bit uh, wary of uh, the previous political dispensation, which didn't seem to be making much headway economically. Um, uh, well, uh, and uh, so those who were concerned about his antecedents, uh, their fears were being at least attempts were being made to allay their fears uh, and essentially uh, by, the, by the rhetoric of uh, uh, Modi was going to rebuild India's economy and it was going to be great again, which is we're going to be a superstar in the firmament of superpowers. <coughs> Pardon me. Because didn't, that didn't pan out. Instead, uh, we, as we speak today, seven years since he's come to power, uh, the economy is just uh, <coughs> crashed. Uh, is doing very badly, very poorly with some of his policies. It's easy to blame COVID for it, but COVID was, uh, it was just a force multiplier of what already he was doing to the economy. <clears throat> but his focus has been uh, primarily twofold. One is uh, building up international partnerships and friends. Uh, and I think uh, he's scored uh, quite well there. Not, yeah, he scored okay. But his, the other area of his focus was pushing forward the agenda of the RSS for a Hindu nation. So for anybody who follows India in the last seven years, uh, it's very, uh, it, it's hard to uh, not notice uh, the plight of the Muslims, the plight of the lower caste, we have the caste system, uh, the threat to media freedoms and judiciary, uh, and the consolidation of power in one hand. And, <clears throat> And the number of projects, um, uh, welfare projects, they, they hog, uh, sure, they hog the media headlines, but uh, some media outlets do tend to focus more on the, the other dark project, the Hindutva project, which is to make India, India Hindu nation. And there's much going on there in, in terms of trying to change the social fabric, rewrite the, you know, the way of life in India, primarily even by way of uh, lynching of Muslims for selling, for, for, for trading in cattle and beef, cow being a holy animal and all in Hindu mythology. Uh, so they made that a big issue. And over the years, especially from 2015, um, you, you read and see even videos of uh, circulating on YouTube of uh, Muslims being lynched and some of them brutally beaten to death. <clears throat> That's one. Changing textbooks, uh, revisionist history, uh, obliterate anything that uh, uh, shows that uh, even the Brits and the Muslims did India lots of favors in making India what it is today. Uh, obliterate those kind of records, renaming roads, renaming buildings after Hindu, uh, Hindu fascist icons, if you want to call them that. So yeah, so that project continues and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it's, it's, it picks up steam uh, or when when uh, especially around elections, because it's a very good, great glue to bring his people together, his mobs uh, about Hindu, for instance, the last elections, it was, it was all about uh, <clears throat> uh, scoring uh, over Pakistan, Muslim nation. And uh, 
So uh, let me put it this way. Uh, his project, the, the RSS and the BJP's project of uh, Hindutva. Now, again, I have to uh, remind you that Hindutva is distinct from Hinduism. Hinduism is a religion. Hindutva is a political project to make India a Hindu nation. So that whole business of Hindutva is uh, actually uh, cruising behind whatever uh, other optics there might be, both in terms of uh, foreign relations and economy. Uh, that's a short answer to your question, Suzanne. Well, thank you so much for giving us this comprehensive background. Now we understand a little bit more what's going on uh, in India. And, you know, there's so many international trends, you know, that are not exactly the same, but somewhat similar in the populist sense and kind of the rebirth of, you know, let's make our country great again, or, or just kind of mm, uh, feelings uh, against immigration and immigrants and threats to our identity as, uh, as nations. So uh, we're going to continue probably seeing a lot of that in the, in the future. Um, mm -hmm. It's a bit, it's worrying in some ways. Uh, hopefully we can try to to kind of taper down the sentiments so that we, there's not so many human rights abuses, and especially uh, in the areas that you've been writing about. Uh, so you also mentioned that the resurgence of Chinese political and economic um, influence on the global stage is something that helps the Hindutva project. It's a boon to the project. And so how is that so? And what are the larger repercussions for uh, themes such as the rule of law, human rights, and democracy? Yeah, so when uh, we bring China into the equation vis-a-vis uh, -vis India, um, we know from uh, since last year, uh, relations have been a bit uh, tense uh, with uh, Chinese encroachment of in, on in, into Indian territory and holding on to it. Um, so when I speak about how the Chinese resurgence, not resurgence, but uh, expansion in South Asia uh, is beneficial to the Hindutva project, uh, uh, it is from the perspective of the fact that China is making itself great again. Uh, India is also trying to make itself great again. So that's one aspect. But the point, the larger point is with China's success in dealing with its Uyghurs, I would say it's success uh, simply because despite all, in, in, despite the international outcry against the treatment meted out to the Uyghurs, uh, China is still doing it the way it wants to do it. And in that sense, I would say uh, India has uh, been inspired uh, by China's success in its handling of the Uyghurs. And so India being uh, a major player now, at least it's seen as a major player on the international scene, uh, given its economy uh, and uh, also it's uh, seen as an uh, important uh, element in any, in any Western policy, when I say Western, it could be the US, it could be Europe, uh, as a bulwark against Chinese expansion. So nobody wants to mess with India at this point in time because of its markets and because of its location, its strategic location as a bulwark against Chinese expansion. So that by way of, uh, when I say that it's um, helpful to India's Hindutva project, it's essentially, I, I pointed out earlier, all the atrocities that are being perpetrated against Muslims, against the minorities, against the media, against the judiciary. You barely hear any international leader of standing utter a word against what's happening in India. Whereas you hear them, uh, you know, probably moaning and groaning about what happens in a small island like Sri Lanka or somewhere in Africa or even somewhere in Eastern Europe, but you don't hear anything. Nobody pulls up Modi and says, hey, watch out, you can't be doing this to your people, whether they're Muslims or the media, as an example. Uh, and why is that so? Because nobody wants to upset the apple cart here. I mean, they, it, in my opinion, Modi can get away with murder and he knows uh, the international community is not going to ostracize him or come down on India with sanctions like that would be the normal reaction, uh, especially in the West, especially when there are very clear violations of human rights, rule of law. Uh, then we're looking at 
the, uh, at, at uh, developed countries of the West, uh, talking about sanctions, talking about ostracizing that particular leader, none of that uh, Modi has to fear. Modi doesn't have to fear any of that. And he's probably his government, uh, we've never seen a government uh, which spends so much time on uh, image management or even, or even optics of everything they do or say. And, and that's in that sense, because he's sitting pretty, as I said, because of its strategic importance, India's strategic importance against China, uh, that makes him feel secure that uh, he can get away with murder and now the presidents and prime ministers uh, around the world are going to raise their voices. They might have back channels to talk to him, but it's not going to be out there in the, you know, in the media glare. And in that sense, I meant what's happening with the expansion of China uh, in the region is actually helping Modi's Hindutva project. He can continue doing what he's doing with very little interference from anybody outside India. Wow, that's uh, that's a really big deal. You know, the West, as you mentioned, is uh, you know, notorious for kind of meddling in the domestic affairs of others and saying, "Hey, you know, shape up your human rights. Uh, this is unacceptable in international legal standards." But uh, the fact that they're not doing that anymore is um, very telling about the status of you know, geopolitics today. And it just yes. goes to show how, you know, that's another example of where they're losing influence. And uh, right. ironically, it's to, to uh, you know, try to stay competitive. But at the same time, you can tell that there's uh, something unusual going on there in their usual modus operandi. Yep. So you also mentioned that... Um, India facilitated China's expansionist goals by the way that it deals with its smaller neighbors. Would you enlighten us a little bit on how you know India treats its neighbors and how that affects China? Sure. Yes. Um, well, India, for a long, being the largest country in the neighborhood in South Asia, and we're looking at eight countries in South Asia: Afghanistan, Pakistan. Sri Lanka, Maldives, Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and India. That's eight countries. So for a very long time, being the biggest country there, I mean, India always liked to be perceived as a big brother. Now you come to me if you have troubles, we help you. But over the years, uh, it's not just a transformation of image, it's even the transformation of India's attitude and behavior towards its smaller neighbors. So from big, from big Brother, uh, it became Big Bully. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, it, it, uh, it intervened in the internal affairs of Sri Lanka, uh, Nepal, just to give you two examples. <clears throat> and um, whether it was uh, in, 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 in the internal strife within those two countries, uh, there was a secessionist campaign in Sri Lanka, there was a Maoist insurgency in Nepal, and uh, India's intervention in both offended both the countries, to examples. And it wasn't very, uh, it wasn't until very recently when the option for these countries to look elsewhere for aid, material aid, or even moral support for that matter, uh, China emerged, China was emerging on the scene. And all these countries are strategically located. Sri Lanka is located in the Indian Ocean. Nepal is up there in the Himalayas. Um, Bangladesh is an important uh, port for them. <clears throat> now, each of these countries have had very, very, very testy relations with India. I won't say they've had testy relations. I'll just say India has been overbearing on all these countries, dictating policy uh, and uh, being totally dissatisfied and unhappy when uh, Colombo or Kathmandu decided to opt for a policy in their own self-interest, but which did not align with India's strategic interests. And so what was India's response each time? Uh, it was not saying, okay, we treat you as equal. You got your priorities right. What, instead, what India would do was go back. They, if not twist their arms, punch them in the face and get them to do what India wanted them to do. And that's been happening. And they were, they were quite successful and India was successful in doing that until China came on the scene. And India was so short-sighted at not recognizing uh, that uh, China's ability 
to fill in, fill the void that India was creating, uh, that it just gave these countries on a platter to China. If you look at Sri Lanka, if you look at Nepal, they're all leaning more towards China. Bangladesh is an exception for now. India and Bangladesh probably have the best relations in the neighborhood, apart from India and Bhutan. Uh, but uh, even Bangladesh has not been spared. In recent political campaigns, you had the home minister of the country, who's probably number two after Modi and Modi's ally, uh, who go around campaigning against uh, Muslim immigrants from Bangladesh, calling them termites in public uh, discourses. And that's offended Bangladesh quite a bit. Uh, they would cancel some, um, some meetings uh, that were important, important meetings last year as a, as a response to that. The point being, with India's uh, very shoddy and uh, I would say, you know, very, um, you know, it, 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 its bullying behavior has necessitated, has compelled all her neighbors, smaller neighbors, to look for options. Of course, the most natural option would have been the United States, but the United States is so far off and the United States has its own basket of goodies, uh, you know, strings attached, human rights, rule of law, and Sri Lanka is not in a position to accede to those uh, given its conduct in the last stages of the war a decade ago, and it's, it's easier to go to China. And matter of fact, during the last stages of the war, they had to rely heavily on importing arms and aid from China to help them win the war. Uh, likewise, Nepal, uh, India was India cracked down rather very, very harshly. And I was in Nepal when this happened in the winter of 2015. Uh, India was dissatisfied with uh, a domestic policy of Nepal. And as a result, India clamped down on them with a blockade, an economic blockade, which meant even, even you know, the basic medication which Nepal imports from India was not available in Kathmandu or anywhere in Nepal. So the kind of difficulties and hardships the Nepalese had to endure for months because of India's economic blockade barely six years ago uh, is not a memory that's going to be erased easily uh, and, and within the people of Nepal. And so in that sense, I meant that the more India ties, tries to... Um, bully its smaller neighbors, the more it's giving space for China to step in and play a, a regional uh, power's role. Yeah, and it seems as though it's just going to continue that way so long as Modi is in power, which <laughs> risks to be quite a long time. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, I, 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 wish, uh, I wish your prediction is wrong about being a very long time. I, I'm hoping something, uh, there'll be some good news in 2024, the next elections. But the interesting thing here is, uh, if I may take a minute here, is uh, when Modi came to power in 2014, May, uh, he did something very unusual, which, uh, which actually um, you know, impressed a lot of uh, people who are, who are not even pro Modi, uh, which is he decided to invite all the heads of the neighboring South Asian countries, seven countries for his coronation, I'm not coronation, sorry, he's swearing in, sorry. Is swearing in. So you had uh, you had the Pakistani prime minister, you had somebody from Bangladesh. So each country was represented by its head. And some of us thought, wow, that is a master, master stroke. I mean, we're going to see great times ahead. So this is May 2014. And what happened within a year? Uh, we lost Nepal completely with the, with the blockade, uh, for starters. Uh, we lost Sri Lanka. Uh, not that we lost, but uh, you know, it got worse. It got worse than before he invited them for his, for his uh, swearing in. And likewise, uh, we, uh, with, uh, the relations with Pakistan have never been as bad as they are today. We've had ups and downs with Pakistan, but this one uh, takes the prize. Definitely. And, uh, you know, like you mentioned, it's just, you know, for a lot of these countries, it's just easier to go to China, you know, the United States Absolutely. has a lot of strings attached, and we're seeing this in many places around the world. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Pakistan, which, uh, you know, a country you've written a lot about as well. And um, let's talk a bit about the, the Gwadar, Gwadar court, uh, which is yep. described as the crown jewel uh, of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. 
Mm-hmm. And it's been the target of increased armed attacks by ethnic separatist groups, despite mm-hmm. uh, the heavy military presence in the region. Mm-hmm. And there's now growing concern that the temptation may prove irresistible, both for Islamabad and Beijing, to apply China's uh, Xinjiang security strategy to Balochistan, where the port is located. So what is this security strategy and what type of implications does this have? Well, the security strategies, if you look at what China has been doing, the Uyghurs, essentially, oh, I would say, uh, doing everything it can to eradicate and erase uh, whatever uh, the its its ethnic culture is, you know, its ethnic it, its its unique culture, and basically standard standardize them, absorb them, and uh, make them one of their own. So we essentially destroy the distinct characteristic of that community, and the way China has gone about it is, if you've been tracking the Uyghurs, what's happening with the Uyghurs. Uh, from, they don't call them prisons, but they call them re-education camps and reintegration camps and what have you, whatever labels they might give it. Uh, the point being, uh, destroy their uh, destroy their past, destroy their traditions, destroy their way of life, and uh, find ways to uh, make them accept uh, whatever the majority uh, ethnicity might be or whatever the majority sectarian is, uh, the sect it might be. Uh, well, the point being, <clears throat> round them all up. Uh, the old word used to be brainwash. The new word is re-educate them and make them a part of the uh, the organism that you want them to be, which is in, in the case of China, it's the Han community. In the case of Pakistan, it's going to be your first a Pakistani and you're no more a Baloki or, or, or a Sindhi. Um, <clears throat> So when I say uh, they might apply that uh, model, uh, essentially it is uh, round them all up, uh, put them in camps for starters, uh, have your uh, surveillance technologies to see that there's no violations, you know, the big big brothers literally watching you, uh, which is what's happening out there. And uh, any sign of dissent, protest, difference uh, is squashed, uh, nipped in the bud, and you want uniformity. You want them to be totally absorbed. And how you go about it, uh, can vary f- from country to country, but essentially the plan is uh, round them up, re- I mean, uh, re-educate them, uh, and then we're fine because then nobody's talking about being a Balok or nobody's talking about being a Uyghur or being a Sindhi. So the implications for that would be, of course, a, 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 a total destruction of an entire ethnic group and the way of life, uh, that's for sure. And, uh, and I think... Uh, it's in a way, it's ethnic cleansing. It really is ethnic cleansing. Uh, you can give it any other name you want, but you can't escape from the reality that it is ethnic cleansing. And when that happens, uh, I think a nation has more to lose than to gain. Now, that's number one. But when that, when if when if if it's seen as being very successful in China with the Uyghurs, and if it's applied to Pakistan, and people start seeing success, that okay, if nobody's talking about Baloks and Sindhis anymore. Uh, what's to stop it from moving to India next? And I mean, someone like Modi must be salivating at the prospects of doing something like that in, in a country like India. And I can see it happening in places like Sri Lanka. So I think the implications are it could have a domino effect in that sense that it, people might be inspired. And <clears throat> two things might work in their favor, like I said to you, because of India's strategic uh, location and its importance against China. Nobody's going to raise a peep. If, if indeed uh, that, way, that model were to be applied in India, um, countries like Sri Lanka, uh, they don't need to care uh, because China is there to back them to the hilt, that kind of thing. So I, I just see uh, that as a very sophisticated form of ethnic cleansing. And I think that obviously is very dangerous. Yes, of course, dangerous and just uh, generally awful. Um, yes, yes. But you mentioned that Pakistan is, an, is wants to be a democracy. Isn't that a little bit uh, controversial, what it's doing versus what it aspires to be? Well, uh, if, if uh, I was able to point out to you one country in South Asia uh, which practices democracy as much as it, uh, or, you know, voices it, uh, I, I, I would do it, but there's none. There's no country. In most of these countries, uh, most of these countries, I'll aware that 
uh, they are equating elections with democracy. It's an electocracy. It's not really a democracy because uh, it's all about winning elections and, and manipulating those wins. You can do it in many, in many ways. Uh, so, uh, but when it comes to strengthening and deepening democratic institutions, the, it's the reverse. They're doing everything in their power. It's not just Pakistan, it's in, in India too. Uh, India primarily, matter of fact, at least with Pakistan, nobody expects them to be doing anything but mouth, you know, lip, paying lip service to democracy because we all know that uh, it's the military that runs the place out there and it's good for them to have a facade of democracy. And so there's, you know, for Pakistan to say democracy, it's all about elections. For India to say it's democracy, it's all about elections, uh, mostly at least. Now and then occasionally you might have a, a, you know, a Supreme Court judge who suddenly wakes up one morning and discovers he has a spine, uh, likewise with the media and what have you. But overall, when, when, when governments in this region, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's India, whether it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, Pakistan, uh, well, we won't even go to Nepal for now, but when they talk about democracy, what they're talking about really is elections. It's not democratic institutions. Nobody, nobody, none of these leaders has invested in strengthening and deepening democratic institutions. On the contrary, they're working overtime to weaken these institutions so that they can have, you know, total power. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thanks for clearing that up. Um, but it also about the China-Pakistan economic corridor, there, it, it might not actually uh, completely take shape due to what you mentioned, uh, you know, the three evils in Pakistan. Uh, so the security situation is not exactly welcoming to this corridor. Um, but then again, why would that be a bad thing in the sense, why would we want to allow the CPEC to take place? Why would it be a good thing for, for the area? Isn't China's influence rather negative? Uh, it, it's a good thing uh, in, in a couple of ways. Uh, number one, uh, I really think if the project uh, uh, did not have uh, any nefarious tendencies or intent, I think it's great. Uh, it, it, it would boost the economy of Pakistan. It would probably uh, also, if the economy were to improve, uh, my feeling is, uh, and if the military did not control the economy, I think it's good for Pakistan. It might diminish the, the influence of the military in Pakistan. I think you know, more, the more people get a taste of, I mean, they did get a taste uh, in, in one, under one regime barely a decade ago, uh, under a civilian regime, uh, but point being, if the economy improves uh, and, the, and it's more likely than not that the civilian forces in Pakistan's government might, might be in a position to diminish the influence of the military in Pakistan's polity. And it, that's, I would say that's one. The second, of course, is to improve the lot of Pakistanis, an average Pakistani in more ways than one, uh, I think that part of the subcontinent is really blighted. I mean, it's just, it's just uh, horrific. Uh, so I think it'll improve a lot and it definitely will have a spillover effect in the region. Because if Pakistan starts becoming self-sufficient, if Pakistan starts building up its own economy, then it has less reasons to feel paranoid and insecure about India then it also opens the possibility of, uh, uh, in, in, it, it improves the possibility of um, less belligerence and animosity between both these countries. So right now, I think part of Pakistan's problem is uh, it sees uh, India as, uh, as, uh, as its primary, as a primary factor for its own, um, you know, let's, let's say the whole subcontinent is in hell. So its own place in hell, uh, it's basically sees India as being responsible. But the point, look, the larger point is, if, if CPEC works, Pakistan's economy improves, Pakistan becomes a little more self-confident, self-sufficient, the impact of the military might diminish in the polity, relations between Pakistan and its neighbors like Afghanistan and India might actually improve because now Pakistan is almost feeling, what is it that makes Pakistan feel equal to India? Nuclear arms, nothing else. You take away the nuclear weapons from Pakistan, 
man, it's going to be hell. But that's the only thing that keeps them on par. But imagine, imagine a situation where economically Pakistan is in a very good position, if not uh, better than India, at least as, because you know, Bangladesh just overtook India and all its economic indicators a few months ago. So if Pakistan can do that with a CPEC, uh, then everyone's happy. And Pakistan and India don't have to be at each other's throats. There's more room for accommodation. There's more room for inclusion. There's more room for collaboration. Right now, because of the imbalance in their, in, in their, in their clout and the subcontinent, um, it's, it's just almost inconceivable that both these countries will actually forget being friends. It's inconceivable that they will uh, even pause to rest a moment to get some breathing space. Uh, and that's what I think. If CPEC works, it's wonderful for Pakistan and the region at large. But if that comes at the cost of erasing and eradicating the Balochs and the Sindhis, uh, I have my reservations about uh, CPEC wanting, should uh, about CPEC, CPEC making it a success. Yeah, it's interesting to see, you know, China's uh, involvement with other countries actually really does help them develop to a certain extent, uh, especially if done, uh, if done right. So, you know, their influence is both welcomed and not welcomed at the same time. So right. I'm interested to see, you know, how strong and how enduring their, their influence will be because of, you know, these reasons. So in terms of great power competition, now that we've discussed quite a few examples here, do you think China's influence is surpassing that of the United States in the region? Um, I would say uh, yes, for now. Uh, but uh, even though it is, I would say not all these countries are entirely happy because they know it comes with a cost. Uh, that's number one. Uh, they would rather be dealing with the United States. But as, as we spoke earlier, um, from their perspective, uh, dealing with the United States or any other power comes with a lot of baggage, basically. We, we go there with a mirror and saying, look, these are, these are all the, your pimples and warts. You got to make sure you clean this up before we can give you uh, what you want. Uh, in the case of China, uh, they take an illusory mirror. Hey, you guys look smart and nice. Here's all the help we can give you. So yeah, the point is, uh, I, I, my, my perception is they would rather be dealing with the United States, uh, but uh, they feel they're compelled to deal with China. And yes, sure, China is in, increasing. It's, it's essentially a race right now uh, between uh, different powers, including India. India wants to be uh, ahead of United States and China and the region, uh, but its behavior is contrary to its ambitions. Um, the United States would like to definitely be a prime player uh, along with India and the region, but it, uh, there are difficulties there. Uh, with China, uh, China makes it seem so easy and simple, so they would be more inclined. And I think even more important now, particularly with India-US relations at its peak, like never before, um, even the smaller powers uh, in, in, in South Asia, uh, uh, here's another factor for them to consider uh, uh, their relationship, relationships with China more favorably, because they feel uh, India as a, as a local bully, uh, uh, they could square it off by partnering with China. But now with India and the US together, it's going to be even more difficult for the smaller neighbors to be able to counter the might of India US as opposed to, you know, for, from their perspective, you know, if in the past, okay, if anything went wrong, we always could reach out to the US and the US could probably put India in its place in its own way. But now they don't see that option because they see India US relations going stronger. And so they can't turn to anybody to keep India in check. The only person they think they can do it they can that who could do that is china and so they have greater incentive now than before yeah i see well um sham you are also uh, an expert in the media and you do a lot of work on this and you were you know a former journalist also so I thought we'd uh, spend the last couple of minutes talking about you know, the situation today in the information sphere so you know, technology has basically made a storyteller of us all. And we're also very 
um, willing to be, you know, deceived by ourselves. We've, um, you know, have distortions and cultural and political uh, values of information and, you know, extreme behavior is enabled in all of us. And journalists also look for facts to fit a particular narrative. And consumers also look for information that suits their own preferences. But nevertheless, you know, there's never been so much distress in the media and there's never been, um, you know, the consumer uh, has never sunk so low in the pursuit of, uh, you know, prurient curiosities, as you quote, as you mentioned in your article. So in your opinion, how can we overcome our own biases and stop exacerbating dangerous levels of polarization in our societies? And what can media channels do to disseminate news more responsibly? And how do we get citizens to trust media? Or is it bad to trust media today? All these questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, many of them. But I think uh, I'll go to your first question is uh, essentially, how do, we, uh, how do we ensure that uh, we, we try and remain unbiased? in our own consumption of uh, media, I think the first thing is uh, you, you, you must badly want to do it. You must badly need to make sure that you're, you, you know, you, you, you minimize bias in, in your life. And uh, that's, that's, there's a huge deficit of that. I mean, I haven't, it's very hard to meet somebody saying, I really, really, really need to be fair and level-headed uh, in these days, it's getting rarer and rarer to find people who say, what's your first priority? I want to be fair and level-headed. No, it's not. I think that's, that's the problem. Um, and I think that is, again, the result of, uh, I, I think it, okay, let me go this way. I think that's a result of our education system. I think if that was a trait, if that was a value, if that was um, uh, it's something that we were taught from kindergarten, from childhood, about being fair and being level-headed and, you know, being unbiased. Uh, I think that would go a long way. It, it is something that one has to learn young. It's not that people as they grow older want, can't learn it, but I think it's, if that was drilled into most of us as we were growing, and I'm sure you're fighting your own biases. I'm fighting my own biases. And we may not even be aware of some of our biases. Mm. But the fact is, we are aware to the extent that we are looking for them if, if and when they crop up. Uh, but I think when I speak about a co consumer who is looking for the kind of information uh, that would satisfy his or her uh, prudent needs or, or even political beliefs or anything else, it's because they don't seem, they may not even be aware that they're biased. I think first that awareness has to come in. I think once that comes in, uh, uh, I, I'm gonna jump to your last question. I think once that comes in, that behavior alone would be a check on media. That alone, no, not that alone, but that would be a very strong factor in, uh, in uh, influencing how the media sells its products because they know that after a point uh, everybody's uh, bullshit meter is uh, very active and their credibility is at question or in initially uh, when, when 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 media was becoming a very powerful player in our in our lives uh, what was it that uh, what was it that was media's chief currency it was credibility if, if you lost your credibility, you lost your readership. Today, of course, that doesn't matter. But there's still a section of media whose entire existence hinges on its credibility, which is why you find them investing a lot in fact-checking and making sure they apologize if they mess up and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Credibility is the biggest currency. And if, if we as consumers, as citizens, as civilians, or whatever, even in the military, if we make ourselves aware uh, about the need, the important need, uh, to be unbiased and level-headed, uh, that will that will definitely influence how the media treats us. Right now, they can be dismissive about this because they know I put this on the front page; th those guys love it. And uh, for them, as far as they're concerned, the bottom line is sales and marketing and whatever. And so, 
I think if as individuals, I don't know how we're going to do it. I, I can only speculate, not speculate, but I can only think that it's best done from childhood, the importance of being unbiased and level-headed and fair. If we had all, and which is what the media should be doing, unbiased, fair, and honest. Uh, so if, if those are values that were inculcated in most of us as we grow up, I think the, I go back to the fact that it would definitely influence how media treats us. Media can get away treating us the way they do because we are the suckers. We, we like it. We like it. We love it. So that's the mainstream media. But when you talk about social media, it's the same thing. There will always be junk. There will always be uh, stuff that will polarize societies. But ultimately, it's the consumer who decides. I mean, I can sit here and have 250,000 followers listening to my version of uh, Hindutva. Uh, but if those 250,000 people were smarter, if they knew uh, what's a bias, for instance, or how do you, how do you overcome a bias, uh, I'm not going to have 250,000 followers. I'm going to have fewer and fewer. So ultimately, it's us who are responsible. We can blame the media all we want, uh, but I don't think the entire blame is with the media. We made the media what they are. And the media is just giving us what we want to a large extent, to a large extent. And I'm, I mean, it's very gen I'm making a huge generalization. I say we, we, we. And of course, there are so many different we's, but point being, uh, uh, from the media's perspective, they're giving the consumer what the consumer wants. And that could well be very, very, very true. And so ultimately, it's, uh, it's the education system that has to be revamped and make this a very important part of the curriculum uh, from as young as possible. Yeah, I really like uh, your approach to that. It, it kind of reminds me of the supply and demand, uh, you know, approach for uh, you know our problems uh, with Latin America and uh, organized crime and drug trafficking. We, yes. we are, you know, demanding as a society products, which is why there's so much supply. And you know, to control that problem, we have to control the demand somehow. And it's the same with um, media and social media, you know, it's just yes. building the resilience through education and the society so that the demand won't exist. Therefore, the supply will be cut off. Precisely. So, I like that. Thanks very much. And, you know, thanks for a terrific interview. I, it was really interesting for me. Oh, I enjoyed talking, Suzanne. It's wonderful. There's always to talk with you, but this was nice. It, uh, uh, it's early morning here in Honolulu and you can't have a better start to a day than getting impassioned about some of these issues. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll wake you up for the rest of the day. <laughs> so thanks again, Sham. And uh, to our audience, thanks very much for tuning back in and see you next time.